are a lot of temptations to take shortcuts. So for example, one of the major uh, aspects of design-based research is to work closely with practitioners. Well, <clears throat> practitioners can be frustrating at times. They can also get busy with other things, their priorities can change. And so at some point you might think, well, it's easier to go ahead and do our thing without the practitioners being involved as much as they should be. And so you have to make compromises sometimes, but at the same time you should really try very, very hard to keep involved with the practitioners as closely as possible. I think there are other uh, possible temptations involved in uh, not taking into account the local uh, variables that might really impact the outcomes of a particular iteration of your design-based research project and t attempt to generalize beyond the data more than is really justified. In most cases, uh, I think, educational research is so contextualized, so linked to the particular uh, stakeholders that are involved, the particular situation, the particular content, the particular assessment measures and so forth, that it's really difficult to uh, generalize and say, well, you know, this treatment worked in this situation, therefore it ought to work in that situation. Um, Lee Cromback, who the late Lee Cromback, someone I really admired during his career as an educational researcher, said that uh, in a sense all findings in educational research are just a working hypothesis. And I think that I feel that way myself. And so we have to be careful as design-based researchers to not overgeneralize, uh, to not think that we've found the solution for many, many different contexts. I think another uh, potential <clears throat> area of, uh, in a sense, not being as socially responsible as you could be is the urge to uh, publish or perish. I mean, we, we, particularly those of us who are in academe, and particularly if we're younger faculty or graduate students, we're under a lot of pressure to publish or perish. And the reward system, unfortunately, is still uh, definitely biased toward referee journal publications. And so when we write these papers and we want to get them accepted, there might be a temptation not to, in effect, really change the results, but to paint the best picture possible rather than to really reveal the complexities, uh, the inherent uh, uh, problems that inevitably arise in a real context. In educational research, uh, the results can be fudged, if you will, uh, much simpler, much easier than um, painting spots on mice. And I, and I think there's, we always have to be careful to be as ethical as possible and to reveal all the complexities, all the problems, all the errors that occur in a real situation and uh, really stay on top of that. One, one of the ways you can do that, of course, is by keeping the stakeholders involved and everybody keeping everyone else honest, keeping everything open and sharing and critiquing, constantly re-examining, looking at things from different perspectives. You are trying to instantiate a theory in some sort of, of uh, treatment, some sort of solution, some sort of innovation. And so, uh, you, there, but there's always a lot of inference between those theoretical design principles and the actual substance of the treatment. Uh, and so, there would be uh, a temptation perhaps not to reveal those leaps of inference that are made in, in uh, actually instantiating the, the design principles. Similarly, if your solution gets some good results, but those results don't necessarily align with your design principles, there may be a, 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 you know, an opportunity to uh, change your design principles. But if you do that, you have to be as open as possible and really base that on the results. One of the people who's done a lot of work in design-based research uh, is Paul Cobb, and I've heard Paul Cobb talk a couple of times. He's a, a researcher at uh, Vanderbilt University whose area is math education, and he talks a lot about the difficulty of documenting everything that occurs 
within a design-based research project. And that, that audit trail that you need to develop or that a trail of all the decision points that have been made, all the compromises that have been made, really have to be well documented. And, and that sometimes in the rush to get a project done and to really refine a treatment or uh, modify some design principles so that you can get a research article out about those, that you might not uh, take the time, the necessary time, to document that. That's where I think technology could help us. For example, um, <clears throat> there are, uh, I do usability testing sometimes, and in usability testing there's specific software that's been developed in order to track uh, your observations, but also in a sense you log your thought process that, uh, that's sort of a running narrative of what you're seeing at the same time. And then you can go back and you have the actual video of what the tester has done, but you also have the notes of your thoughts about how you reacted to that, and you can compare those and, and uh, make judgments based on that. I think we need tools in design-based research that would allow us to uh, actually capture what goes on in the project, uh, and ideally a lot of that could be done with video. Uh, for example, the video analysis tools that are being developed here at the University of Georgia in the Learning Perf Performance Support Laboratory under the leadership of uh, Dr. Art Recesso, the uh, VAT project, uh, I think that that has a lot of potential for being used in design-based research to actually capture those decision processes, those uh, activities that go on uh, in the negotiations between practitioners and researchers and other participants to either modify the treatments, modify the, the design principles, modify the data collection strategies. Uh, you're always finding that you know what you ex the data you expected to collect it just isn't available. You know the kids show up and they forgot to bring their video releases. Uh, and so suddenly you can't do video. So, well, what do you do in that situation? Well, maybe you keep very careful observation notes of what went on, but of course, there again, there's more inference involved in observation notes than in actual video capture. So you're always faced in any research project, not just design-based research, but experimental research, qualitative research, you're always constantly having to deal with reality and uh, the, the artifact, if you will, of research that's constantly changing and, and uh, you have to make those adjustments. But in design-based research, you have an inherent responsibility to document all of those. And one of the reasons that some people dismiss design-based research or, or severely uh, critique it uh, is um, they feel like researchers uh, can often fail to make those documentations and, and paint the best pos possible picture of what occurred and tell a story that maybe didn't really reflect the reality of what went on. And so uh, I think you have to almost err on the side of overtelling, over complexifying, if you will, the situation than trying to oversimplify it. I know that Paul Cobb and, and some of his colleagues at Vanderbilt have been trying to build some, in a sense, uh, data repositories uh, where um, the story, all the um, components of a project are maintained and can be re-examined uh, at some point. <clears throat> but you've got, in order to, you know, publish and not perish, you have to eventually write papers in a traditional format, and uh, and that's where I think we need also some new tools. For example, web-based uh, digital repositories of data of, of the information that's been captured about a project so that other researchers could go back and re-examine that. But I think design-based research in a way has to be a lot like um, historians uh, writing history. I mean, most historians <clears throat> will spend years in various libraries looking at original documents. They can't 
take those documents with them. And so they have to, uh, in a sense, convince the uh, reader uh, and the reviewers, the peer reviewers, that they have done uh, a, a fair, honest, and accurate interpretation of those documents. Uh, we know, unfortunately, that some uh, well-known historians from time to time have not necessarily done that, have actually, uh, there's been some exposés, for example, of, of well-known historians uh, maybe making the data a little too convenient for the story they were trying to tell. And so uh, we need new ways of, of uh, documenting and capturing that information so that other researchers could go back and re-examine it. The problem is, of course, probably no one is, but at least you'd have that potential. A lot of people in our field of instructional technology, or at least some well-known people, think that our field should be a science, that we should think of instructional technology, uh, well, of education as a science, and instructional technology as the application of that science. Um, <clears throat> and I am coming around to the idea that education is not a science. It's more of a craft. It's more of a design field. It's, it has a lot more uh, uh, similarity to uh, engineering or architecture and even art. Um, and so that it, you get to a level of interpretation of inference that maybe is not as susceptible to scientific peer review as traditional scientific research is. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not dismissing peer review. That's an absolute pillar of any kind of progress in education, I think. We have to have that. But we may be not, we shouldn't necessarily think that we've got to apply the exact same standards and criteria that we might apply in physics or chemistry or biology to education as a field of inquiry.